begin by saying that some of you may be aware that two, three weeks ago now I was in Scotland speaking at the University of Edinburgh and there the audience was approximately 1,000 in the McEwen Hall which is rather like the Albert Hall of Edinburgh and certainly most of the audience were Christians. I could tell that from the reception of my jokes. So, in comparison, this is a, this is, this is a friendly, friendly little get-together. It's also, however, on the same topic. Now, in Edinburgh, I did actually have a challenger, a gentleman by the name of Professor Gary Habermas, who has made something of a career out of the resurrection. If I tell you he has written no fewer than 16 books on the subject, you will see how he is perhaps one of the world's leading authorities on the resurrection, if such a person can exist. I'd like to say I trashed him, but I dare not till I see the videotape. Okay. At the moment, the tape seems to have disappeared into the editing suite run by the Christian Union at Edinburgh University. Uh, so what emerges eventually uh, is anyone's guess. However, an enjoyable session then, and, and we're looking at the same topic this evening. Now, some of you may remember, I spoke to you perhaps a year ago on the subject that is close to my heart. Jesus, saviour of the world and non-existent fabrication. There we were looking at, one could say, the earthly existence of Jesus of Nazareth and considering is there any evidence to support the fact that this guy may have wandered around to Galilee and so on. And I hopefully presented a case that said, well frankly, there's no such evidence that you, you can really point a stick at. Now, that same topic I discussed on Premier Christian Radio on occasion with a former canon of St Paul's Cathedral, Michael Saywood. He argued the case for a historical Jesus, but let's say after an hour with no great success. Towards the end of that occasion, he made the comment, well anyway, I hadn't discussed the resurrection, and the heart of the matter of Christianity is the resurrection. Okay, after 500 pages, yes, I may not have got onto the resurrection, so I suggested maybe it would be covered in the second book. Well, since that time, I've certainly considered the matter in some great depth, and that is no small trick when you think of what are your sources for the resurrection. They are pretty slender, pretty slender. But nonetheless, Christian defenders and the, the whole industry of apologetics has succeeded in generating a vast volume of literature, hence the 16 books that Gary Habermas has managed to put together. So from a small base, they have created a large literature, and it does need an answer. I think many of you might, if asked, would dismiss the idea of a resurrection out of hand. People do not come back from the dead. How much proof do you need? Millions of people dying every year. Do we need much proof? None of them come back from the dead. However, we do need to answer that case, and it is, it is very important. It's very important for a couple of reasons. For humanists and, and atheists, it's important because it is one of the arguments in defence of a god. We are often familiar with dis discussing things like first calls, creative design and, and the rest of it. But actually for many Christians, I now realise, for many Christians, the resurrection itself is proof of not only a God, but their God. That is, is crucial for them. So we need an answer for that beyond simply dismissing the idea of a resurrection out of hand. And that's why it is useful to look at how they construct an argument how they construct a defense of the resurrection. Now, I've been through a lot of the literature, and for many Christians, of course, the resurrection, the idea that Jesus returned to life in this super form after death, for many Christians, that is an article of faith. They take it as an article of faith. They believe it. it it's something that intuitively appeals to them. They think it fits to the, into their scheme of, of belief, and it's, it gives them hope. Now, that's fine, but, of course, if religion relies upon faith, it's in a very vulnerable position because we've seen more than a century of scientific investigation which has pushed back the frontiers of tenable faith because science has explained things were previously attributed to God. And many Christians, of course, felt themselves backed into a corner of a diminishing area of believable facts as they saw them, as science proved and explained much of the universe. However, the Anglican Church is but one part of a global network of Christianity, and its most powerful 
and wealthy segment is not in this country at all, but is in actually in America. Now, the same wealth that poured into America for all kinds of reasons after the Second World War also found its way into the churches of Middle America, of the Bible Belt, of the various centers of evangelical belief in America. It is that funding which has created a whole sector of education in America which pours out many students and many professors who now make up the industry of apologetics. And to give you just one little fact in that area of information, there is in Texas the Texas Christian University, for example. Now, many of you might query the idea that you could have a university that's Christian, but in America there are many of them. So the Texas Christian University has, in actual fact, endowments of $1.3 billion. So it gives you an idea of the sort of funding that is available for their various courses, and they do courses in apologetics, they do courses in, in presenting Christ to the masses, and if you actually look at some of these apologetic books, they are actually primers for promoting Christ. And they actually present in summary form what points you should make when you confront the sceptic on the doorstep. He will say this, you reply with that. And it's the whole argument spelled out for the would-be evangelical, how to win people for Christ. Now what we have there, of course, is a combination of American sales technique with a very fundamentalist interpretation of Christianity. And yet they are now the big players. And this is what is now an evangelical crusade, not simply in places like Britain and Western Europe, but in particular in countries like India, in the former Soviet Union, in the Far East, Everywhere the message is being taken, and it's being taken in this slick, sousy presentation. And of course, if somebody is not equipped to deal with these sort of arguments, they can be blown away. You're probably all familiar with that famous trilemma of, of C.S. Lewis, liar, lunatic, or law. And if he isn't a liar, and he wasn't a lunatic, he must be a law. Hallelujah. And if you don't see through the tricks, if you don't see through the flim flam, you can be sucked into that sort of thing. Particularly when it's all that cuddly, hands on, let's be all lovies together with Jesus. So I want to unravel this fabricated, salesy technique of promoting Christ as if it was the best form of detergent. Because that is how it comes across. Now, let's start with the Bible. Let's start with what is the case presented in the Bible for the resurrection. And after all, what is the resurrection? The return of Jesus after death in this new super body, which has many qualities. It, after all, can move through unopened doors and appear and disappear will, which always leaves me the riddle, why did they need to move the stone then? <laughs> Why couldn't he just teleport himself out of the tomb? Now, there are lots of oddities to the story, but what does the Bible present? Well, it presents very little. And in fact, how little, I can show you here. They are the verses from the four Gospels, the book of Acts, on the resurrection appearances of Jesus. One side of an A4 sheet. I've even included the little reference from Revelation where this strange creature with a sword out of his mouth breathes fire. But that is all we have. To put that into a format that's perhaps more readily understood, here's the equivalent number of words, or something a bit more familiar. It's the menu for a McDonald's Happy Meal. <laughs> it actually has slightly more words than the references in the Bible to the resurrection. Now, I don't know how many people would take McDonald's Happy Meal menu as good enough proof of the nutritional value of a Big Mac. <laughs> but, oddly enough, there are millions of people who take that as proof of something quite extraordinary, that a man rose from the dead. Now, let's think about that for the moment. Let's suppose we went home this evening and the news reported that Saddam Hussein had resurrected from the dead. <laughs> Would we believe it? Would we believe the film footage showing Saddam Hussein walking along the streets of Baghdad? We might not even believe it if we saw Saddam Hussein 
in the studio with Jeremy Paxman, <laughs> answering every question he might put to him about dying and coming back again. We would still think, fake. Fake film, it's a joke, it's a parody. And if we were truly convinced that that was Saddam Hussein, back from the dead, we would then say, well, he wasn't dead in the first place. The Americans hid him. You know, they killed an actor. It was all fake. It was fake film. We wouldn't even believe it then. So no matter how much evidence was presented from something that might have happened yesterday, we would not believe it. Now, if we said, well, never no mind about Saddam Hussein, how about Abraham Lincoln? Well, we definitely wouldn't believe it. We saw Abraham Lincoln talking to him with Jeremy Paxman. We would say he's an actor. We wouldn't believe it. And yet, what happens to people's minds when you put the clock back 2,000 years and the only thing you can present to them is that. What is it about the gospel that is so awesome and convincing that people believe it implicitly? Something that is beyond all credibility. Now the answer is a series of little props that the church has refined and developed over the years. One of the perhaps least convincing is the reference to the success of the church. Isn't that proof that it was all true? Does that mean that every religion that has been successful was true? It's to say the church exists, therefore it is based on truth. It's nonsense. If we wanted to look for the origins of, say, Mithraism, which was successful for three or four hundred years immediately before the success of Christianity, no one would be going looking for a real Mithra appearing from the side of a cave. They would accept that it's social forces, it's political forces, it's psychological needs on the part of some people to believe in something that causes accept, and that religion therefore grows. But nonetheless, this idea that success proves the, the truth is still used by Christianity. Okay, in this thick volume produced by the Christian Evidence Society, <laughs> It does spell out several other reasons for the resurrection. It includes such wonderful tidbits as the love of Christians. There's a wonderful proof for you. That because Christians show such love for fellow human beings, that therefore there is a proof there of the resurrection. Now, these are clutching at straws. They would not convince anybody, except believers, of course. But apologetics, the industry I spoke of that has its engine of production over in America, is not happy with that. It has developed and refined a program that would convince a lot of people, and does convince a lot of people. How does it go about it? Well, it goes about it in a series of steps. For example, how many witnesses do you have there, would you say? That's the taken from the New Testament. How many witnesses? It's one book. Oh, well, one book is actually made up of lots of little books, so therefore we can have several with Now, let me illustrate how apologetics goes about this little trick by applying the methods of apologetics to the story of another person who was resurrected that you may at the moment imagine is a fairy story. This is the resurrection of Snow White. In the story of Snow White, she dies, towards the end of the story, she dies, she's killed by the wicked queen. The jealous wicked queen gives her a poisoned apple and she dies. But if you remember, a handsome prince comes along and kisses her, and she's restored to life. Now, in that story, we have a resurrection story, and if we were applying apologetics to that, it would go something like this. We have the evidence there of changed life. Whose life was changed? Well... The handsome prince's life was changed. How so? Well, he got married and they lived happily ever after. So his whole life was changed by the nature of the resurrection. First witness. Second witness, and this is a particularly good witness, this is the wicked queen herself. She wanted Snow White dead. But Snow White's recovery, the wicked queen, who gives evidence of Snow White's recovery, therefore is a particularly good witness because she was a hostile witness. Somebody who doesn't want it to be true, in effect, gives a better witness than somebody who did want it to be true. Who else do we have as a witness there? We have the uh, servant who was sent to, to kill Snow White in the forest and then changed his mind. So we have perhaps what we would call a, a sceptical witness there. 
we have the additional witness, and a very particularly an embarrassing witness, and this is, again, helps the case no end, because if we have a witness that's embarrassing, that surely proves its truth, because, you know, we'd have bona fide witnesses if we could, but an embarrassing witness, perversely, is even better for proving authenticity. And the embarrassing witness for, for the resurrection of Snow White is, of course, the mirror on the wall. Okay, the mirror on the wall is such a ridiculous notion, and yet there it is, giving evidence of the resurrection of Snow White. And finally, of course, we have the witness of happy, grumpy, sleepy, <laughs> sleazy, dozy, bashful and dock. In total, we have 11 witnesses to the resurrection of Snow White. Overwhelming evidence. Overwhelming evidence, and that is how we can prove the case for Snow White. And that is precisely what apologetics does for the resurrection. Who is the hostile witness to the resurrection? Well, that's St. Paul, of course. That's St. Paul. He wanted to destroy the church. Right? He persecuted the church, and lo and behold, he gets a vision of, of Christ, and then he becomes a devoted and bold evangelist. The only problem with that is not the story of Snow White. It's coming from the same storybook. We're using a character in the storybook to demonstrate the, the reality of the resurrection. Okay, the sceptical witness, a sceptical witness there? Well, that's, that's supposedly the brother of Jesus, James. Okay, if you remember, the family of Jesus in the storybook thought he was crazy. And yet James, apparently, in a very vague area, becomes leader of the church and the first bishop of Jerusalem for 20, 30 years. So we have a sceptical witness there converted. Good witness there. We have the changed lives of the apostles, and this is a big one that they use a lot, okay, and it ties in with this notion of the growth of the church. What's the story with the apostles? Well, we all know the story. They were dejected, they were depressed, their hero had been crucified, he seemingly was dead and gone, and they were in hiding. But if you turn over the page, of course, they're bold evangelists. They've seen Jesus and they are then energised to, 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 to create the church. And so we have this notion put forward with very little evidence that the church grew explosively from this beginning. Suddenly they were everywhere, willing to face the lions in the arena and the how heroic, and they would only do that if it was all very genuine. The trouble with this entire story, a bit like any story, it is fabrication built on a layer of fabrication. If we want to know who or what the Twelve Apostles are, we are extremely limited. We are extremely limited. For five years now, I've had an article on my website saying there is no biography for the Apostles, and if any Christian cares to tell me one, please do. And nobody has, because nobody knows. Some of the Apostles are solely mentioned in one or two verses in the Gospel. And evidence for the persecution of the Church it's virtually non-existent before almost its legalisation by Constantine. Even some of the church fathers in the third century acknowledged there was no persecution of the church. I was a lot again to Hollywood and this idea of Christians being eaten by lions and the rest of it. Why would Rome have had any interest in persecuting this marginal set of religious innovators who weren't even known or noticed by the Roman system. It's true. So whilst apologetics gets away with this notion, which everybody more or less accepts, you know, we all have this image in our head, the Christians thrown to lions and they're sitting there meekly with their eyes cast up to, to heaven, saved by the Lord. So there is no underpinning persecution of the church and there is no evidence for these hero figures that supposedly give evidence that the church was built from that basis. We have to look elsewhere for the origins of the church and it doesn't grow out of this foundation myth. Okay, let me look at one or two of the, the pieces that are crucial to the case when argued with apologetics because one of the things that Mark they hold most dearly and something that was put to me a couple of weeks ago, was supposedly this creed that exists in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, an epistle of St. Paul. Now, that is regarded as prime real estate in the justification of the, uh, the resurrection. It's barely about 25 words, but nonetheless, let's assume every one of those words is a gem. What does St. Paul say in 1 Corinthians? Well, it gives a list of who was seen by the risen Jesus. Quote it here so I don't get it wrong. 
This is the list. And he was seen of Cephas. Now, Cephas is the Aramaic name for Peter, so don't be confused by that. But he was seen of Cephas. Now, notice he doesn't say where or when. That's it. That's the evidence. Then of the twelve, again, no rhyme or reason. That is the evidence. After that, above 500. Again, no place, no occasion. After that, James, then the apostles, and then me. Now, that little rhyme, which is known as the creed, identified as a creed, is allegedly what Christians put together shortly after the crucifixion, just so they would remember. That's the argument. They put it down just so they remember. Now, to give you an idea of how poorly that squares with what the Gospels say, and after all, they're all part of this same list, how inconsistent it is even within that list, who would we say Jesus first appeared to? Because actually, the Synoptic Gospels actually say Mary Magdalene. Did he appear to the twelve? Well, actually, no. If you think about it, one of them betrayed him. And depending on whether you believe the story in Matthew or the story in Luke, he either hung himself or burst open. But certainly, there weren't twelve, there were eleven. And in fact, if you read God, John, the Gospel of John, there weren't actually eleven at first, there were ten. Because later on, Thomas joined them and said, I want to see the whole. Okay, so... This creed, which supposedly sets in cement these early apparitions, fits very badly with internal evidence of the Gospels themselves. A real killer is this 500. Believe it or not, someone like, a leading apologist like Josh McDowell, he said in the 500, we have 50 hours of first-hand testimony. If each one of those 500 gave five minutes testimony in a court of law, it would add up to 50 hours of, of first-hand evidence. At that point, you may need to take a paracetamol. <laughs> <laughs> one reference to 500 without time or place or occasion or name or anything, unsupported by all the other Gospels, and yet that is now turned into 50 hours of first-hand evidence. Take another little instance. How many women visited the tomb? If you look at the Gospel of Luke, it was more than four. If you look at the Gospel of Mark, it was three. If you look at the Gospel of Matthew, it was two. The Gospel of John, it was one. And to Paul, doesn't mention any. There you have it. Now that's what we are confronted with in this idea that the resurrection of Jesus is not simply a fact. It's one of the best evidenced facts in the whole of history. Because they can pile up all these different references, 500 here, 12 there, 11 there, 10 there. Complete baloney. I'm sorry, but it is complete baloney. And even theologians accept that it's an unresolved mystery that none of the testimonies actually agree. This idea that we have copper-plated testimony from first-hand witnesses is complete moonshine. We would actually have, here and now, more evidence for the resurrection of Saddam Hussein. <laughs> the idea that these supposedly mutually supporting testimonies from five or six different sources substantiate a most incredible claim cannot be made. And after all, are we looking for slight support? Are we looking for slight support, like trying to confirm the name of a, a servant for Emperor Claudius. No, we're actually trying to find really good support for the most incredible claim we might make, that somebody can overcome death and re be returned to life. And yet, what do we find? We find a chaos of confusion in the testimonies themselves and a lot of spurious and deliberately deceitful nonsense, and yet, presented with all the slickness that American salesmanship can present, and this is what is being marketed across the world. And I think we have to stop it. Thank you. Thank you.